Okay, good morning, how's it going? Thank you for being here. Really excited to be at Bill, this is my first Bill. It's, it's awesome, what a fantastic community. My name's Andy Lee, and I'm a product designer and engineer, and I wanna tell you why this decade is gonna be the decade of robots. It's gonna be great, and it's not what you think it's gonna be. I'm gonna tell you today about where robotics are, uh, where they're going to go in the future, and how we're going to get from here to there. Actually, hold on one second. So, how many of you, real quick, have a robot in your home? Raise hands. Okay, not so many. I'm actually going to argue that probably all of you do. You just don't know it yet. So, a robot is what happens when we take motors and sensors, a uh, human interface, computing, we put that all together in a way that does something useful and we get a robot out. So with that new definition, we can kind of start to think that maybe actually we do have some robots, at least in our kitchen, maybe in other parts of our home. Um, and I'd also like to take a minute to say I'm not going to talk about autonomous travel, cars, airplanes, any of that. I'm going to keep it to kind of in the house, in the office, in the factory today. Robots in the kitten, kitchen. Holy uncanny valley, that is, how do I, there we go. Those look scary, I don't want those guys in my kitchen. Um, this looks a little awkward, this is, these are all, I don't know where these came from, these are all industrial research projects. Um, that's, uh, it's kind of like in 1970 when you saw pictures of computers, they were all looked like IBM Research Center. So that, and we all know that's not what computers all turned out to be, so I'm, I'm gonna say this is probably not what robots are gonna look like. Uh, I'm gonna step back and talk about a form of a robot that's more like a plant, less like an animal. Kind of a square plant, kind of like, uh, like if you grew watermelons to fit in your refrigerator. Actually, microwaves, refrigerators, and ovens are kind of like the plant version of robots. They, they actually do something for us, right? They have interfaces, they have computing, they have motors and sensors. So they, they fit our broad definition of a robot. Um, but you're, you're probably thinking, no, that's not a robot. That, that's just a machine that, that kind of, it just sits there and it, 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 you know, it does things when I want it to, but it's not like connected to the internet. It can't like figure out how to talk to me. And it, like, well, well, wait a minute, why, why can't we connect all these objects in our household to the internet? They, they should be totally hackable. And um, actually, here's a really interesting example. Someone took their toaster oven and wired it in to the internet so that they could do um, solder reflow with it. But actually, I think it'd be really cool if uh, you know we could hook up our microwaves or whatever to the internet, and then we could actually download recipes to our kitchen gadgets and they could start to work together to make our food for us, right? We could, if you had a scale that was connected and you had a mixing bowl that was connected and you had an oven that was connected, you could start to do some interesting things. But this also brings me, that also sounds really complex, which brings me to my next issue, which is robotics kind of has to have a landscape of learning curves to it. There has to be the very simple, easy uh, user GUI, but then we probably want some sort of software interface that has an ever increasingly complex way to talk to it so that you can do increasingly more awesome things. And when I was doing research on this, I thought, well, obviously this isn't out there yet because I haven't seen it, and then, sure enough, someone has already started on the Open Laundry API so that your laundry will get done for you. Um, that was pretty exciting to find out. So, it, and also other people have been working on this as well. Panasonic took a stab at what does the automated kitchen look like, and I think they're getting some things correct here. I like the idea that they're gonna use my original pots and pans. I, I kinda like those for sentimental reasons, my dishware, whatnot. Um, 
Not so sure I want a gantry robot in my kitchen, though. That's going to look a little awkward with my cabinets. And, um, the, but the, it's starting to get there. Things that kind of can talk to one another, have an interactive presence. I think what the early kind of really smart products, early robotic projects in our kitchen are going to look like are going to look like this sous vide machine, which for those of you who don't know is an immersion cooker that you stick into a pot and it heats up the contents of the pot. Uh, this was kickstarted, and if they had put a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth low energy module on it, they could have easily had people sharing the heating profiles for different recipes as well as the recipes. And so right there, we're, we're seeing a paradigm shift. People can, you don't have to be GE or whatever to, to make a difference in automating kitchens. So that, that was robots in the kitchen. I'm going to go back now and talk about robots that we all kind of agree are robots. And those of you who think you have a robot in your house, my guess is at least some of you have a Roomba. And the Roomba is a pretty awesome little machine. It runs around. It cleans your floor for you. It also had this really neat feature that they let you access the serial port so that you could program it if you wanted to. And that's what's dangling out there. Is a, I think that's a Bluetooth module that someone was thought, you know what? I don't want it to run around autonomously. I want it to run in the pattern that I've chosen. Or who knows? Or maybe they wanted it to bump into you know, their cat. Or who knows? But all kinds of fun things you can do once you add a little bit of connectivity and smarts to these already pretty powerful machines that we take for granted in our everyday lives. And so I, the Roomba is a pretty fantastic machine. It's kind of like the trilobite analogy, if we're going to go now animals of robots. It's going to be around for a long time, just sucking away dirt on the seafloor of your living room. All right, now we're moving into where we are right now. So this is Baxter. This was in a, rec this is a photo from a recent Wired article. And Baxter is a stab at making a general purpose robot that can do human chores, like picking up an object, putting it in a box, moving the box down the line, doing that over and over again. At, um, at $20,000, it's not going to kind of replace every human job, but it's starting to get, you know, you can imagine a job where it's like, do I hire a person and have to deal with a person and da 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 da? Or do I just hire a machine and amortize that out over four or five years? And this, uh, OK, you know, we're getting into the area of, is it OK to give robots human jobs? Well, I think Kevin Kelly got it right. There are just jobs that are going to go to robots. Right now, humans can do them better. Very quickly, robots are going to be able to do them better. Um, we saw this happen with the internet. I bet none of you actually called up a physical travel agent to book your ticket to Bill today. Yeah, no. So, OK, here we go. This is interesting. Robots playing Rock'em Sock'em robots with a human. <laughs> this is, um, so robots, yeah, they're going to take our jobs. But this, you'll notice, is what we call in industry a caged robot. You'll notice that cage all around it. And that cage is there because this is really just a series of motors getting a set of instructions on where to go. It doesn't know what's around it. Um, and that's why it's in a cage, because if the human goes in the cage, the human is now in a space where the robot, which weighs hundreds if not thousands of pounds and has kilonewtons of torque, can you know, do some pretty serious damage to the weak little human. Uh, you definitely want to stay away from the wrong end of these things unless they're programmed to be a roller coaster ride. But they're starting to get a lot of sensors. And for those of you who are not familiar, this is the PR2 uh, that Willow Garage developed several years ago. It is a very large robot. It weighs a few hundred pounds. It has quite a lot of motors and whatnot in it. It also has a lot of sensors and computing on it. And this was developed to start to create a language that we could actually develop on top of for how is the robotics industry going to enter into the home. OK, so what's going on here is really interesting. This is a PR2, and the man in the photo is a mute quadriplegic. 
He can't get out of the way, and he can't yell for help. This robot is going to bring this little plastic stick close enough to his face so that with the limited range of motion that he has, he can scratch himself for the first time in a decade since he went quadriplegic. Um, you, it's got to be pretty sensitive because if it runs into him, some robot programmer is probably going to lose his job there. Um, but what was awesome about Willow Garage, they're kind of going through a transition phase right now, is they spun out the Open Source Robotics Foundation, which has lots of really fantastic libraries, which are going to also enable robotics in all kinds of interesting applications. The first of which that we're going to see in businesses are telepresence robots. Um, and actually, so the, the Willow Garage is one of their spin outs is Suitable Tech. Many of you will recognize any bots there, the, the Segway version. Uh, I think the Vigo, was that the one that was in the Verizon uh, commercial recently with the kid wanted to go to school even though he was sick? There's a bunch of these coming out. This is a space I'm very interested in because it not only allows you to do a very high fidelity video chat where you're driving around the space and experiencing it not just from the user's laptop camera or their phone camera, but you can control where you're looking, and that's pretty fantastic. It also does something, which is it lets robot programmers start to have a, a commodity vehicle that they can experiment their code on, and how is an autonomous vehicle going to drive around the built human environment? How would it navigate this space or downstairs? This brings us to the issue of, well, now we have machines which are in our environment. They're going to be interacting with us. How are they going to interact with us? What are going to be the, the software interfaces that we're going to experience? And it, it's, um, they're, they're going to be interfaces we're already familiar with. Just like when we started interfa interfacing with computers, we took the model of the typewriter, removed it forward. We're already familiar with Siri, touchscreen interfaces. We're familiar with the Kinect sensor. It's, we're going to be leveraging these tools to interact with all the fantastic machines in the future. And in fact, the machines are going to leverage our smartphones. Um, this is from a company called Wowie Robotics. And they're using the fact that the iPhone has all of an accelerometer, GPS, compass. Mainly, it has wireless connectivity and a USB port or Bluetooth so that it can talk to the machine and give it instructions through the internet. Uh, and this is uh, my business partner and I are looking into this space as well. This is a photo from, I believe, 2009 or 2010. We were working on doing survey robotics uh, back when we were at NASA, and now we're more interested in telepresence robots. Uh, and this is, um, we're, we're going to make these look better, don't worry. These are the early stabs. But I, I think this is an interesting time for robotics because we live in an age where not only can you kickstart a robotics company, you can kickstart a satellite company, which is pretty awesome, right? This is the ArduSat. This is um, a CubeSat that can fit inside a, a multiple satellite payload on a rocket. And you know, for it brings the cost of launching your small satellite into orbit you know, down to a, a few thousand dollars from a, a few million dollars. So. I think this decade we will see machines that will have the full functionality of Rosie the Robot in our homes. Uh, I don't know if we're going to look like Rosie the Robot. I don't know if it's going to be this form factor, but all of the kind of physical stuff in our homes will become automated. It might, and we may need a machine that, that somewhat goes in between all the other machines and interacts. And that really gets me excited that this, uh, this next five to 10 years is going to be the time when that actually happens. Because if you think about it, back in 2007, the iPhone came out. So none of you probably had an Android or an iPhone before then. So uh, there we go. All right. Thank you, Bill. It's a wonderful to speak here. Uh, I'll take one quick question. If